So with that, I am very pleased uh, to have everyone joining us for today's session. As I stated, my name is Jean Balance. Uh, I'm an environmental scientist here at EPA's Technology Innovation in Field Services Division, where I'll be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. Again, our topic is SBIR, STTR, Funding Opportunities for Water Nanotechnologies. This webinar has been co-hosted by the US EPA and the Nano not, pardon me, National Nanotechnology Initiative, or NNI. The NNI employs various mechanisms to foster and support interagency collaboration and community engagement in areas of national priority. This webinar is supported by the NNI's Water Nanotechnologies Community of Interest, which aims to support water sustainability through nanotechnology, providing nanoscale solutions for a global scale challenge. This webinar today is going to offer small businesses and academic researchers an opportunity to hear from some of the federal agencies that fund water technologies with a special focus on those investments in nanotechnology enabled solutions. Our speakers today will describe the fundamental goals of the Small Business Innovation Research, the SBIR, and Small Business Technology Transfer. STTR programs at various agencies, and they'll share details of current and upcoming solicitations. The SBIR and STTR programs fund a diverse portfolio of startups and small businesses across technology areas and markets to stimulate techno technological innovation and meet federal research uh, and development or R&D needs and increase commercialization to transition R&D into impact. Now I'm going to pop up a quick poll question. I know our speakers were interested in learning a little bit about our audience. And our first question that I will ask um, is if you have a previously applied uh, for SBIR or STTR funding. So you all should see a new pop-up window on the screen. You can click the circle to the left and then hit the submit button. And as I'm collecting some additional responses here, I will carry on with our introductions. Uh, as it looks like about half of you have indicated your responses. I'll just remind you that we may pop up some questions like this throughout our broadcast. And of course, you can always type your questions into the Q&A box uh, using that button at the bottom of your screen. And we will try to get through as many questions as we can. Uh, we really are looking forward to a very lively conversation. So please add any clarifications, slide numbers, speakers, or agency specifications when sharing your questions so that we can direct them to the right speakers. Uh, let's take a quick look at those responses. And it does look like about a third of the audience have previously applied for funding, uh, but two thirds of you have not. So I wanna thank you all for sharing uh, those responses and that helps our speakers understand who's joining us today. I'd like to move on now to introduce our speaker. So our very first speaker today will be Genevieve Lind. She is an SBIR program manager at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. NOAA encourages SBIR proposals from qualified small businesses for highly innovative technologies with strong commercial potential that will fit within NOAA's mission to understand and predict changes in climate, weather, ocean, and coasts, and to conserve and manage coastal and marine ecosystems and resources. Genevieve is bringing years of experience in the SBIR, STTR, and technology development space at NIH's National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, or N. INDS and the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, NHLBI, and the Small Business Administration. Our second speaker will be Heather Henry. She is a health science administrator for the NIH, or National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, NIEHS. The NIEHS SBIR STTR program helps bring technologies to market that detect exposures to environmental hazards, improve understanding of environmental health science concepts, increase worker health and safety, provide innovative test systems for understanding the effects of toxicants, and remove contaminants from soil, water, and or air. Heather is overseeing the Superfund Research Program, or SRP grants, that span human health toxicology, risk assessment, detection technologies, and remediation approaches. She has been with NIHS since 2006 and provides guidance to potential applicants for SRP's multi-project center grants, they're called P42s, individual research grants, R01s, small business technology transfer grants, R41 to 44, the virtual center for transdisciplinary and translational research, or VICTOR, R01, and time-sensitive grants, R21. She represents the NIHS on a joint subcommittee on environment, innovation, and public health, uh, PFAS strategy team, and the National Nanotechnology Initiative Water Nanotechnologies Community of Interest, as well as the Federal Remediation Technology Roundtable. 
after Heather will be joined by Rajesh Mehta, who is an NSF SEIR STTR program director since 2012. The NSF um, commercial, pardon me, the NSF SBIR STTR programs focus on transforming scientific discovery into products and services with commercial potential and or social benefit. They support the creation of opportunities to move uh, fundamental science and engineering out of the lab and into the market or other use um, at scale through startups and small businesses representing deep technology ventures. Prior to joining the NSF in 2012, he worked at Kodak for 26 years in various R&D positions. At the NSF, Rajesh has managed a number of technology portfolios, including advanced manufacturing, nanotechnology, education technology, and advanced materials. He's currently managing the environmental technologies portfolio. Our final speaker today will be April Richards. She is a program manager for the SBIR program for the US EPA. The EPA's SBIR program focuses on supporting small businesses to develop and commercialize novel environmental technologies that address EPA's mission to protect human health and environment in areas such as clean and safe water, climate and air quality, land revitalization, homeland security, sustainable materials management, and safer chemicals. April has worked at EPA for over 20 years and has worked on a as a fellow on the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, where she provided technical expertise on environmental issues. She previously worked for an environmental engineering consulting firm in Florida, primarily in drinking water treatments. So I hope you all are as excited as I am to have our four special speakers joining us today. With that, I'd like to do one final comment before I turn it over to our first speaker. And that's just to uh, hope that you will all join us for future EPA and NNII, pardon me, NNI public webinars. You'll find more information on all of the NNI public webinars on the NANO website at nano.gov. I'll be sending that link in the chat in just a moment. You can also follow the NNI on Twitter at NNI uh, Nano News and on LinkedIn at National Nanotechnology Initiative. So with that, I think we're ready to turn things over to our first speaker, Genevieve. So Genevieve, I see that you are on camera. I'm gonna go ahead and push your video up for the audience. If you could share your screen, I'll let you know when the slides are up and we can begin. Coming right up. All right, we have your slides up. Please feel free to begin. Awesome. Thanks very much, Jean, and thanks everyone for, for joining us here today. Um, I'm going to start out by providing a quick high-level overview of the SBIR and STTR programs in general, and then transition into the specifics of the NOAA SBIR program before handing it off to my colleagues so that they can tell you about the programs at their respective agencies. So the Small Business Innovation Research, or SBIR, and the Small Business Technology Transfer, or STTR programs, also known as America's Seed Fund, are one of the er largest sources of early stage capital for technology commercialization in the United States. America's Seed Fund is congressionally mandated depending on an agency's budget. Agencies with extramural research and development budgets over $100 million per year are required to set aside 3.2% of that budget for the SBIR program. And agencies with extramural research budgets over $1 billion set aside an additional 0.45% for the STTR program. There are 11 federal agencies with SBIR programs and six with an additional STTR program. And those are shown in dark blue on this slide. This amounts to over 7,000 awards made to small businesses and nearly $4 billion in funding every year. Each agency administers its own independent program within guidelines established by Congress. Agencies release a solicitation at least annually with research topics that align with the agency's mission. The program was established to achieve some specific goals the first of which is to stimulate technological innovation by providing seed funding. It was also initially established as a mechanism to help small businesses meet federal research and development needs. The third goal is to increase private sector commercial commercialization of innovations derived from federal research and development funding. And finally, there is a broad program goal to encourage women and socially or disadvantaged or economically disadvantaged individuals to participate in innovation and entrepreneurship. 
In addition, the STTR program aims to foster technology transfer through cooperative research and development between small businesses and research institutions. So what is a small business? A company must be for-profit, US owned and operated, and employ under 500 people to qualify for the SBIR or STTR programs. In addition, the project must be done in the United States and the funds are for research and development. In general, the SBIR and STTR programs are structured in three phases. The first phase, phase one, is generally for feasibility or proof of concept work. These awards last for six months, between six months and one year, depending on the agency, and the amounts range from $50,000 to $270,000. Phase two supports further research and development of the technology for 24 or more months, and these award amounts tend to be between $500,000 up to $1.5 million. The objectives for phase three is for small businesses to pursue commercialization objectives resulting from the phase one and phase two research and development activities. Phase three is not funded through SBIR funding. Some agencies have additional mechanisms beyond this basic structure, and they will tell you more about any of those here today. Generally, the SBIR and STTR programs are very similar in many ways, except for three critical differences. The STTR program requires partnering with a nonprofit research institution, whereas the SBIR program permits partnering, but it is not a requirement. Secondly, with the SBIR program, the principal investigator must be greater than 50% employed by the small business. With the STTR program, the principal investigator can be employed by the small business the research in, or the research institution. Thirdly, the STTR program requires that 40% of the work be done by the small business and at least 30% by the research institution partner. For the SBIR program, these are maximum caps for the amount of work done. Um, and with the SBIR program in phase one, you can subcontract up to 33% of the work and in phase two, up to 50% of the work. And finally, um, majority venture capital ownership is allowed by some agencies with the SBIR program, but it is not allowed with the STTR program. So now I'm going to transition and talk specifically about the NOAA SBIR program and the details. So the mission at NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, is founded in science, ser service, and stewardship, and is to understand and predict changes in climate, weather, oceans, and coasts, to share that knowledge and information with others, and to conserve and manage coastal and marine ecosystems and resources. NOAA divides its mission into 10 different mission areas, and those include weather, climate, oceans and coasts, fisheries, research, marine and aviation operations, charting, satellites, sanctuaries, and education. The NOAA SBIR program is looking for proposals for highly innovative products and services with strong commercial potential that fit within these NOAA mission areas. We've made a number of changes to the NOAA SBIR program in recent years, including a move towards issuing broad topics in our solicitations because we are looking for innovators' ideas to solve problems that fit in our mission space. For our fiscal year 22 solicitation, which closed in February, our topics were climate adaptation and mitigation, weather-ready nation, healthy oceans, and resilient coastal communities and economies. For the fiscal year 2023 20, solicitation, which is still under development, uh, we, are, we don't have the topics yet, but they should apply to the same general principles. If you wanna learn more about technologies that we've supported in the past, you can check out our website, which I will have a link to at the end of the presentation. Um, there we post our previous solicitations as well as abstracts of funded projects for the last um, number of years. 
So in terms of water nanotechnology and what uh, our approach means to this community is that we're looking for in a, uh, your innovative nanotechnology based ideas that solve problems that fall within the no emission. Those uh, solutions might include technologies that facilitate improved coastal water quality, supporting human health and coastal eco ecosystems, sustainable fisheries and safe seafood for healthy populations and vibrant communities, improved freshwater resource management, healthy habitats that sustain resilient and thriving marine resources and communities, healthy people and communities due to improved air and water quality services, and recovered and healthy marine and coastal species. These examples are straight out of the fiscal year 22 solicitation, so be sure to check the fiscal year 23 solicitation when it is available to see what our priorities will be in the coming year. As you probably noticed, the NOAA mission covers a lot of ground from the deepest parts of the ocean to the surface of the sun. And because of that, we support a wide array of technologies. Sometimes it can be a challenge to know for sure whether your technology is a fit for the program. So we have implemented a required letter of intent as part of our application process. Applic applicants submit a brief summary of their technology and its commercial potential and we are able to provide feedback on whether it is likely to be a fit for the mission, the SBIR program, and the solicitation. Applicants can then use that feedback to decide whether they should put in the work to submit a full application. For fiscal year 22, the letter of intent was due about a month after the solicitation opened and we provided responses within another month. The full applications were due about six weeks after that. So let's get into some of the key logistical details of the SBIR program at NOAA. For fiscal year 22, we had an estimated budget of $11 million, which we administer through a grant mechanism. We have one solicitation per phase per year, and those are released through grants.gov. For phase one, we're looking for new ideas that are ready for feasibility or proof of concept testing. These are six month awards for up to $150,000. We typically award between 15 and 30 awards per year and our success rate in the past has ranged between 10 and 20%. Our phase two competition is a limited competition for phase one awardees only. These awards support full research and development for the technology for 24 months and up to $500,000. Because it's a limited competition and we award 10 to 15 awards per year, the success rate is higher and tends to be between 50 and 75% for phase two. Again, as I mentioned previously, the uh, goal for phase three is to pursue commercialization objectives, which with the NOAA program can include government acquisition, but also private sector investment, product sales, and other types of commercial activities. Again, the important thing is that phase three is not funded with SBIR funding. So now that you have an understanding of the program details and the direction the program has moved in recent years, I want to cover a few basic tips for developing a successful application. So the four key compo components, which also make up our review criteria for a NOAA, a NOAA SBIR program, are science, innovation, commercialization, and team. So NOAA is first and foremost a scientific organization. Science is the foundation of the NOAA mission and should provide the foundation of your application. A large portion of your score is based on the scientific and technical merit of your proposal, so make sure that you are clearly identifying the significance of the problem or opportunity and detailing the technical objectives of your proposal from a scientific perspective. But also, be aware that our expert reviewers come from a variety of backgrounds, so try to use language in your proposal that will be understood by a general audience and avoid using too much jargon. Another significant portion of your score is the commercialization potential of your technology. Make sure that you have a strong understanding and clear description of the market opportunity, the competitive landscape, and the commercial potential of the technology you are proposing to develop. A third key component of your proposal is innovation. 
One of the fundamental goals of the SBIR program is to stimulate technological innovation, so be sure to clearly address what problems you're solving, what makes your technology innovative, and what sets you apart from the competition or what is already available. Finally, your team is also an important component of your score. We want to make sure that you have the resources and scientific and technical expertise necessary to complete the proposed work. Building a team that has all the necessary expertise is critical. Moving beyond the key components of your proposal, it is essential that you read and follow all the instructions in the Notice of Funding Opportunity, which is available through grants.gov when the solicitation is posted. Everything you need to know about what information you need to provide and how it needs to be organized is found in the NOFO. It's a bummer when applications don't move forward through the process because they failed to provide required information or documentation, but it happens every round. So please make sure to read and follow the instructions if you do intend to apply. We also recommend getting started early so you can make sure to give yourself enough time to develop a strong application and submit as early as you're able. Life happens and things cause delays. Give yourself a buffer in case you encounter obstacles because we're not able to accept late applications or give extensions regardless of the circumstances. Finally, especially, especially if you're looking at more than one SBIR program, it's essential to know the details of the program, many of which I have addressed here today as you are preparing your application. There are many differences between how the different agencies administer their SBIR programs. So don't assume that because you have applied for a National Science Foundation or an EPA SBIR award previously that the NOAA application and process will be the same. Pay attention to the details and you will have a stronger application and a better chance of getting awarded. I will leave you today with uh, additional information if you want to learn more about the program or connect with us. You can email the program in general at noaa.sbir at noaa.gov or you can email me at my email address on the bottom of the slide which is genevieve.lind at noaa.gov. You can go to our website to learn more about the program and sign up for our newsletter, which is where the first place that we announce when a new funding opportunity is available. We're additionally developing more resources and training opportunities that will be available on our website as they become available. You can also follow us on LinkedIn at NOAA Technology Partnerships Office and on Twitter at NOAA Innovate. And that is everything that I have for today. And I will hand it over to Heather from NIEHS. Thank you. All right, uh, let's see if this is working. Can you see my screen? We can. Excellent, <laughs> I love that, I love technology. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what NIEHS is doing more or less in the environmental technology space, though certainly we welcome all applications that um, are focusing on nanotechnology and water. And we certainly appreciate the NNI and Maria Fernanda for uh, putting this together. So just for to orient you with uh, the NIEHS, we are a part of the National Institutes of Environmental, excuse me, the National Institutes of Health. There are 27 institutes and centers. So we're, we are one of those centers. You can see in the red dot. Uh, we follow the NIH mission, which is to apply fundamental knowledge to understand health outcomes. And then the NIEHS specifically is looking from the perspective of how environmental exposures impact health. Now, I represent the Superfund Research Program, and so we are sort of a little bit different than the, the regular part of NIEHS, the general part of NIEHS. We were founded under the Super Amendment Reauthorization Act in 1986, and so this adds to the NIEHS existing mission of looking at the um, health effects related to environmental exposures, and then adds to that remediation and detection technology, so solutions for understanding um, how to improve some of the situations and reduce exposures to improve public health. And of course, uh, relevance to Superfund is important as part of, uh, of, part of what the Superfund uh, program does. 
So within the context of SBIR, the gen we have a robust general portfolio of NIEHS, SBIR, and STTR grants, and my colleagues Dan Shaughnessy and Ravi Ravishandran um, are leading that uh, portfolio. And uh, within the Superfund Research Program, uh, we fund remediation and detection technology grants. So the general portfolio, for the most part, uh, covers a lot of biomedical applications, but also funds some exposure reduction um, opportunities. And so I'll be talking about that in just a minute. In terms of the mechanisms, this slide summarizes uh, what is available under our programs. The phase one program, as was mentioned by Genevieve, is meant for discovery and can be used to perform feasibility studies, usually from six, to one, six months to one year for us. Uh, phase two is meant for further development and may involve full R&D, generally up to two years. The phase two B uh, for us is generally only through a request for application. Um, and then for those grantees who, who do get into the system, are, they are able to apply for a commercialization readiness program. And that allows them to request additional funding for up to two years to address some of the hurdles of uh, commercializations, um, such as manufacturing assistance. So the ultimate goal of these post phase, phase two uh, support mechanisms is to encourage companies to fully develop and reach a stage for commercial to commercialize the products for broader use. And just to note that NIH is not a customer, um, and I'll get to that um, to that point in just a minute when we talk about the, um, the funding opportunity announcement. So we follow the omnibus funding opportunity announcement that is not only for NIH, but also includes CDC and FDA. So there's a lot of institutes, the 27 institutes of NIH plus CDC and FDA. So as you can imagine, this is a lengthy, uh, a very broad uh, uh, call for applications. And, it's, and along with the FOA comes a very lengthy document that tells about the specific topics that we're looking for. And I'll be talking about that in just a minute. But I just wanted to say that the work proposed um, is largely investigator initiated. Um, Though at times there are specific funding opportunity announcements that are released or notices of special interest. Um, and we have an open notice right now in the blue bar at the very bottom. This is a notice of special interest for innovative technologies for research on climate change. And I encourage those of you out there to have a look uh, because certainly, once again, nanotechnology uh, is could be one of the approaches to address some of the issues. Of, um, of climate change and human health. And certainly uh, we know water is a big aspect of that as well. So I have included uh, the overall funding levels for the NIH, what we received in, in 2021. Okay, so in terms of what the areas are in the omnibus um, F funding opportunity announcement, again, covering the wide uh, area topics that include not only the NIEHS, toxicology, screening, modeling, biomarkers of exposure and response, but also the, the type of work that uh, Superfund does, which is related to detection technologies and remediation technologies. So in the context of, again, water applications and some of our more environmental opportunities, under the exposure assessment call, um, we are certainly interested in sensors because it helps us understand what exposures uh, humans may be experiencing. Um, also, within intervention technologies, we call out specifically looking for VOC exposure, drinking water contamination, and real-time alerts. Um, and again, as I mentioned, the Superfund program specifically looks for detection and remediation of hazardous substances in the environment. Um, and then we also have a topic area about disaster response, looking for sensors and tools that can be useful for disasters or emergency response. And overall, we have an emphasis on novel approaches using state-of-the-art technologies uh, for any of these environmental health science approaches. Uh, I do want to make the point that outside of the scope of NIEHS, pathogens in the environment, that is something that our uh, the other um, another one of the I NIH ICs covers, uh, NIAID. And so here I give some more detailed descriptions about uh, the topic areas related to environmental technologies and specifically water that fall under the NIEHS general SBIR STTR program. 
Um, that could be exposure assessment tools, such as those that are, would be used for drinking water. Um, could be, we also have a program for nano environmental health and safety. And so this can help us detect nanomaterials or nanoplastics in the air or water, as well as other parts of the environment. And then may also uh, help us understand leaching of, of engineered nanomaterials um, within water filtration systems. Intervention technologies, again, uh, this would help, this would fall under uh, the, the general NIEHS portfolio, uh, looking specifically at drinking water primarily for home use. And then disaster response, as I mentioned previously, has many applications within water. Um, but again, uh, this is not to be limited just to water, although we're emphasizing that for the, for the purposes of, of, of the NNI webinar, uh, just to make a point that we are, we are also interested in, in general um, other media that would have human health implications. Um, for the general portfolio, it's a different payment schedule. Phase ones are uh, 275,000, uh, phase twos are 1.8 million, and we get very specific on the numbers there, don't we? <laughs> this is total direct costs plus indirect costs, as well as any fees. And so now, now I'm gonna shift gears and talk about the Superfund remediation and detection topic areas. We uh, just covered the SBIR within the Superfund Research Program. And again, we, we have many different uh, areas that we're looking for within remediation. And we welcome uh, nanotechnology approaches, but of course, we're not exclusively looking for nanotechnology approaches, just any approaches that are novel and can be applied to um, contaminated sediments, bioremediation, chemical mixtures, delivery of reagents and amendments um, into groundwater, um, what look, developing new amendments that can be used to stabilize contaminants. Uh, there's com complexity to many um, sites, especially hydrogeologically. And so how do you develop remediation tools and techniques can be used for that? Uh, we're looking for resilient technologies, knowing that with climate change, uh, any, any solution would need to be uh, operatable under several different types of um, fire, flooding, and land use change conditions. And then of course, uh, we, we really call for people to be employing um, sustainable and energy efficient approaches. Um, for us, the total direct cost, indirect cost fee total, it, it goes up to 173. And for, for phase one and for phase two, it's 1.15. Um, and then some, another point I wanted to make is that while we are the Superfund Research Program, and while we do want there to be relevance to Superfund, we're not, uh, it's not a requirement that you work on a Superfund site. Okay, and so that was just the remediation technologies. Now for the detection technologies, You're looking for uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, getting in the computational approaches to really understanding um, fate and transport, um, or, or to be utilized as part of a sensing platform. Uh, very helpful uh, to have on-site analysis. So the capabilities of, of doing that and developing tools that can be, um, that can be used on-site as, as opposed to grabbing a sample and having to analyze in the lab. This has a lot of, um, a lot of benefits for site management and decisions about um, where to do remediation efforts, where to target remediation efforts. Passive sampler devices, Rapid sample, sample cleanup and preparation tools, um, field sampling devices or kits, um, ways, novel techniques and sensors that can help us better conceptualize what's happening at a site. And then also innovative tracer technologies. All of these uh, detection type technologies really assist in getting a better handle of what the extent of contamination is and to follow the progress of remediation efforts as well. Um, so we, we do also list specific examples of remediation needs. Uh, we get a lot of input from our colleagues at the, at the uh, EPA. Um, I, I sit on a committee, the Federal Remediation Technology Roundtable, and then we also have colleagues within the ATSDR, and they give us some tips about where, where there's real need, uh, vapor intrusion, PFAS, mining, complex site geology, disaster response. Um, again, these are all just ideas. This is, we are truly an investigator initiated program. And again, we do not, um, we do not 
become the, or, you know, we will not be a customer. So it's really up to the, um, the applicant to understand where the best use of their technology is. Um, again, pathogens are outside of the scope of, of a super fund, just like NIEHS. Interestingly, the CERA legislation um, it specifically says that petroleum is not a hazardous substance. So in keeping with our mandates, we do not cover a petroleum related remediation or detection technologies. Um, okay, and so uh, review criteria. Uh, there are, this is very similar to the, what NIH does for any of its grants, uh, looking at approach, uh, the making sure that there's, the approach is innovative, significant, that the environment is, um, is going to bring the high probability of success, and also the expertise of the team. For phase ones, again, this is a research and development um, initiation. And then for phase two, of course, it's meant to be commercial development. So when it comes to the phase two, it's absolutely important that you have your commercialization plan together. Um, however, in the phase one, it is, it is good to have an indication that you've done an analysis to know what the potential market is for your technology. Um, we also just want to emphasize how important the novelty of the technology is, um, that you're not making just kind of an obvious next step, but you're still advancing science. And a little bit about our peer review. I don't want to go into a lot of detail here for the sake of time, but uh, there it's very similar to what Genevieve said. Three reviewers are, are, are assigned to your application. They will be experts in the field. However, you'll be your application will be discussed among a review reviewer uh, panel that does not necessarily have your area of expertise. Um, so there is an expectation of preliminary data, fundamental science, novelty, and innovation. And um, as I mentioned before, just, just a hint of commercialization is good, even for a phase one. In terms of post-review, the scores are typically released within three to four days of the review in the summary statement, which um, gives an idea of the strengths and weaknesses identified by the reviewers. That will come within two to three weeks of the review. Um, you can revise and submit one more time uh, to the applicant. Uh, in, and uh, submit your application again. And it's recommended that you speak with your assigned program officer. Um, we have a link here for, you can see who has uh, been on the past review panel. So you can get an idea of the composition of the areas of expertise. And you yourself could even volunteer to review. I have a link at the bottom of the screen here and would um, I know that our review folks would be delighted to have reviewers. <laughs> we do have three submission dates. Uh, generally, I, I should have said this before, that the funding opportunity announcement generally gets updated around the May-June timeframe, and then uh, the, the receipt dates are September 5th, uh, January 5th, and April 5th, and uh, the review usually happens with, within um, two or three months, then they go to a second level of, of uh, advisory review, and then finally, uh, the awards are, are typically made, so it's about a uh, a six month process at, at best. <laughs> there are uh, required company registrations. This is similar for all of the agencies. So I will just allow you to come back at your, at your leisure if you need to look at that. One thing I wanted to let people know about, if you have not applied for an NIEHS grant or any kind of NIH grant for that matter, I would encourage you to look into the application assistance program. This is a free, mentoring opportunity for applicants who intend to apply. Um, if you join the cohort that is happening now and the applications are, are due um, at the end of, towards the end of September, uh, then you'll be in good shape for the January 5th um, deadline. Uh, there's a webinar and they also have office hours. So encourage folks to look into that. And then in terms of there's other programs that may or may not apply to you as an applicant. And so one is called REACH, and that is for uh, the program um, bringing, air, bringing uh, research, uh, excuse me, um, there are research centers that can provide some commercialization assistance. It depends on what state you're in. 12 states uh, are, are participating. And then there's also um, the, the Regional Technology Transfer Accelerator Program for IDEA states. Again, so this just will apply to a limited number of potential applicants, but I encourage you to look into that and see if, if it applies to you.
Okay, so we have a few other additional resources and success stories. There's a sensor technology for the 21st century page. In fact, all of the agencies represented here have uh, examples of some of their successful pay or some of their successful SBIRs there. Uh, we recently had a virtual technology fair for our small business grantees, so you can get a real feel for uh, the type of work that we fund. Um, there's uh, all their other success story opportunities that are linked from here. And then overall, NIH has a great opportunity, a, a seed program that is meant just for developing and helping um, SBIR applicants. So there's lots of resources there. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, my thank all of you, my colleagues, Dan and Robbie, who assisted in putting together these slides. And then also again, Maria Fernanda for uh, organizing this and then Jean for her excellent um, moderating. And with that, I will pass it off to the next speaker. Oh, and these are my summary slides. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, uh, so I'm going to share my slides. Yep. We'll let you know as soon as we can see it on the screen. As you pull up your presentation materials, I will provide a gentle reminder to those who may have joined us a little bit late that uh, questions can come in in any time using the Q&A or uh, Q&A button that pops open in a new window. You can type in your questions and comments. We'll be breaking later today uh, for an open Q&A period with our panelists. So I'll ask everybody to refrain from raising their hands uh, and just start sending in questions and comments using the Q&A box. Uh, we also have links to download all presentation material. I know many of the slides have websites in them, and so we have links uh, to download each of these presentations already available on the seminar homepage, and I'll put that back in the meeting chat for everyone as well. Rajesh, um, are, have you been able to share your screen? Yes, I have. Um, can you stop and try again because we're not seeing it yet? Okay. Okay, can excellent. If you, yep, we see the PowerPoint now and looks like you're going into presentation mode. Perfect. Yep. Go okay. ahead. Well, thank you everybody for uh, joining this session and for the organizers for uh, this opportunity to share some information about NSF's program. Uh, I'm going to actually focus more on the water nanotechnologies because our program is pretty broad based. And uh, I just have a picture here uh, that, you know, uh, for the sustainable uh, development goal number six is all about water. And it is a, a universal goal because these issues uh, pertain not only to high income countries, but also to low income countries. So uh, opportunity is huge in terms of making a difference to the world. If you are working on uh, using nanotechnologies to impact the uh, water. Uh, I'm part of National Science Foundation, and uh, I also wanted to alert you that uh, uh, our <coughs> foundation just started a new directorate called TIP, the Technology Innovation and Partnership in March. And this uh, directorate is entirely devoted to translational research because the rest of the NSF funds basic foundational or use, uh, curiosity based research. And this is about taking those results out into the real world through the translational efforts. So I encourage you to uh, look into that. Uh, you, you probably have seen this uh, uh, slide about value of death, that uh, there is plenty of money given at the early stage to do foundational research, but then there is not enough support. And then if the technology is developed uh, to a sufficient level, then the private market steps in. So uh, SBR program, STTR program at NSF, essentially tries to provide that bridge, but with the uh, foundation of TIP directorate, now we have many more programs that can allow you to take your ideas to the marketplace through a number of different avenues. And SBR, STTR is just one of them. So I'll just show you a few of them. Some of them have been pre-existing and there are new programs that are coming in. There is one partnership for innovation, there is convergence accelerator, there is innovation corps and so forth. But uh, today I'm just going to focus on the SBIR STTR program. Okay, so uh, the last time when we published uh, the data uh, in, that was for financial 2019, 
our program was about $212 million large. Uh, we typically invest up to $2 million in seed funding. And ours is a grant program. It's not a contract. That means uh, we are uh, not looking to buy anything. Or we don't have any specific deliverables for you uh, to deliver uh, because we are just basically market driven. If you have any idea uh, about an existing problem in the marketplace and you have a very innovative solution that will change the game in the marketplace, we encourage you to uh, apply to our program. We fund close to 400 small businesses every year Genevieve did a very nice job uh, before uh, explaining to you what are the foundations for the SBI or STTR program. And they all apply here. And like uh, she said, uh, we are all trying to catalyze commercialization of high risk technological innovations to have a societal impact. So uh, all those things are important. Uh, and I just want to highlight that in terms of this picture. Uh, these are not three different boxes to check. These are all interwoven. So our, all our proposals are evaluated on the basis of three criteria that are interwoven. One is the technical innovation and the level of technical risk that is there. Uh, if it is a very low level of risk, uh, that's not a very competitive proposal, uh, which is a little bit uh, counterintuitive. Uh, we are looking for out of the box ideas. Uh, and uh, uh, if you are successful, that gives you tremendous uh, advantage in the marketplace and you are able to scale that idea much faster because of your technical advantage. We are looking at commercial potential. And again, the minimum requirement that is, there is commercial viability. And we are also looking for the broader societal impact because all the money that we are uh, directing towards the applicants uh, or awardees are really money given to you by taxpayers. So we really want to see that the largest section of the society is going to benefit from your innovation. Okay, so in terms of the money, uh, our phase one is six to 12 months, it's $275,000, and essentially to demonstrate the technical feasibility of the idea. Uh, we do have a slightly different process, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit later. But essentially, it's like a letter of intent, but uh, uh, it's a little bit different from what was presented before. Uh, you have to provide us a couple pages uh, uh, of information about the company, about the team, about the innovation, and what R&D you are trying to do. And if you supply that information to us, uh, we'll evaluate it and respond to you within a month, whether it's suitable uh, for you to actually spend the time to create the full proposal. And if it is uh, uh, unclear, we would exchange ideas with you uh, via email and try to really help you determine whether this is a suitable proposal or not. But only if you are given an invitation to submit the full proposal, you can submit the proposal. So uh, it is just not an advisory thing. This is something where program directors have to invite you to submit the application. Our phase two is uh, two years and a million dollars. And where you really, since you have demonstrated the technical feasibility of the idea, you take it to the next level, scale it up, uh, make it manufacturing ready and so forth. Uh, we also have additional supplemental grants depending on the availability of the money. Uh, there are many such uh, supplemental opportunities, but two major ones that uh, are used by our awardees. One is uh, a TECP, which is Technology Enhancement Commercialization Program, which is up to 20% uh, of the grant. And uh, also there is phase 2B, where we will match 50 cents on the dollar up to half a million dollars if you have sale revenues or uh, qualified investment of a million dollars or more. We, of course, like all the other agencies, also provide $50,000 of uh, commercialization assistance. Okay, so in terms of the process, uh, I would encourage you to go to our website, uh, seedfund.nsf.gov. Take a good look at uh, what our funding philosophy is, what kind of companies we have funded and so forth, then submit a project pitch. You can submit the project pitch anytime. Uh, there is no date or time limit for that. 
and we will respond to you or give you an invitation within one month. Once you are given that uh, uh, invitation, you have one year to submit the proposal. We do have submission windows. And for this year, our, our next submission window uh, closes on Oct October 26th. And then we'll have our, our new solicitation published soon after that. And I expect it, it will have again three submission windows. Okay, so since we have no particular objective in mind, except that it, your proposal meets our review criteria, I'm just going to give you three examples of the kinds of companies that we have funded recently. I'm not calling them success stories, but this is just an illustrative purposes of where you see the nanotechnology playing a role in conjunction with uh, water treatment and so forth and uh, why we think that uh, this might be pretty useful. So here is this company called SolMem. It is a solar multi-effect uh, membrane technology. And what they have is a membrane that is coated with nanomaterials. So it is a photonic material, very thin coating. So you are able to heat the water very close to the membrane surface. And because of the unique technology, they are able to get multiple effect evaporation and they're able to get a significant desalination of the input water. And this technology potentially can be used for treating agricultural wastewater, brackish water. Uh, in reverse osmosis, as you know, we create a very uh, small stream of uh, concentrated uh, salt uh, water that also can be treated seawater and of course from the produced water. So this is still a phase one company, uh, it's still working on it, but I hope it gives you an idea where we are seeing the conjunction of nanotechnology and water treatment and how uh, our, uh, our program is able to fund such ideas. Uh, the next one I wanted to uh, uh, again re-emphasize that, you know, this is a, a pretty important uh, goal for sustainable development and uh, there are really shocking statistics in terms of uh, how various populations in the world are impacted by not having good access to good quality water. Uh, in this 21st century, when we are thinking about going to Mars, uh, it's just kind of uh, pretty important that we use the same intellectual capability to actually solve problem on this planet. And these are actually, uh, from a commercial perspective, huge markets. So if you have innovation, you can actually take it to where the market is and do good and do well. So here is an example, uh, this company called Folia Water. They developed a, a very uh, low cost technology of putting silver nanoparticles on uh, paper and they turned it into a product that they are selling right now in Bangladesh where people who are making less than $10 a day, two to $10 a day, they are able to get pretty high quality water at the cost of you know, one cent a liter. Uh, so these are the kinds of approaches uh, one can think about in trying to address this kind of global problems. My final example is again, a, a company that we recently funded, which is an STTR, this multifunctional uh, nanostructured surface. So it is a sponge. Normally, if let's say there is an oil spill in the ocean, uh, you can throw sponge, it will absorb the uh, oil, then it is generally burnt. This company is developing uh, a technology where the sponge is nanostructured. So it is hydrophobic and oleophilic, and it just only takes in the oil and you can squeeze this sponge, separate the oil and reuse the sponge many, many times. And the same idea can be with little bit of modification can be used for multiple applications, uh, for agricultural runoff, for sewage treatment, or from industrial waste. So again, these are the examples where nanostructured surfaces are used to really treat water and solve some really difficult problems. So uh, that's all I have in terms of the examples. Uh, so this is my final slide uh, in terms of uh, learning more about our program, please go to seedfund.nsf.gov uh, and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions uh, in the later section. Thank you.
All right, thank you. We'll move on to April. April, feel free to share your screen with us. All right, everything looks great, go ahead. Okay, super, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm April Richards with EPA's Small Business Innovation Research Program. Um, and as I watch all these presentations, I'm reminded how <laughs> hard it must be for a small business to try to navigate all of the nuances of each different program. So uh, I do think these webinars are a great way to get at least some foundational knowledge about each of the programs and start thinking about which agencies you might target with your particular technology. So for EPA, we are pretty mission focused. Um, our mission is to protect human health and the environment. Um, I love that short and sweet mission. And so we're using our SBIR program to help us um, see technology innovations that will help us meet that mission. And to save the planet, I always joke that we have a whopping $5 million, more or less a year. Um, we are one of the smaller SBIR agencies, and that means we do one funding cycle per year. So at least it kind of keeps it straight. We, we just had our phase one opportunity close um, literally on Tuesday of this week. So we're going through those phase one submissions. Um, and again, smaller scale, so same phased approach. So phase one is for proof of concept, and we provide $100,000 for six months to really kind of prove out that idea, plant that seed, see if it really has some traction. And then those phase ones that are successful compete for phase two. And that's really to take the technology towards commercialization, you know, as far as you can get with $400,000 for two years. Um, and then we do have that one supplement. Again, uh, we put a pretty heavy focus on commercialization from the very beginning. We don't just want good ideas. We want good ideas that have commercial potential. <laughs> <coughs> so we do have a um, hundred thousand dollar supplement for phase twos if you can get some third party investment and we award everything as contracts so what makes epa different um again listening to all the different agencies with some are really specific topics right nsf is super general um so i would say epa is kind of in the middle we have some topic areas that stay the same from year to year, kind of aligned with our core mission areas, like clean air, clean water, um, safer chemicals. Um, I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, and then under those, we have fairly specific topics. And since our, since our budget is so limited, we really do ask that proposals are responsive to those specific topics. That way we keep a reasonable funding rate. So if you submit a proposal, you'll have a reasonably good chance of getting funded, even though we have a smaller um, overall budget. And then I guess the plus side for us being a smaller agency, once you are funded, um, we work hard to provide you with EPA technical connections to help you think about how your technology might fit with EPA, how, what regs are coming down the line, what other groups might be interested. Um, we do provide commercialization support through TABA, and we really work hard to communicate successful projects. We have some great, uh, we have a great communications team that writes articles, and we do social media, and we post things on our website, and we have a newsletter. So we really, I feel like it's just sort of self-perpetuating, getting the word out. We want to, we want to take full credit for funding you, and we want you to be successful. And often that success comes from communication. And of course, we're helping to protect the planet. So um, kind of like Rajesh said, like do well and do good. I like that saying, like I think a lot of people that apply to EPA, they, they have, they're very market focused and they wanna do well for um, making money for their company, but they really do have impact in mind and are, and are wanting to help protect the planet. Uh, so again, our solicitation just closed, but I'll just include this information because that's where we post funding opportunities. We have a portal called FedConnect, which is where we um, actually post the solicitation and receive proposals. And probably the most important thing sort of for the timing right now is this listserv. This is just dedicated to EPA SBIR. And if you're interested at all in our program, I just encourage you to sign up for that. Uh, we won't spam you too much, but we let you know when there's funding opportunities or other opportunities, like EPA's been doing some prizes and challenges. And so we'll kind of communicate any news like that that might be of interest 
to this audience. So let me just talk a little bit about topics. Um, here are the one, two, three, four, five, six, I should know that by now, six broad topic areas that we have uh, more or less every year. So clean and safe water, air quality and climate. We do some Homeland Security. People don't always think of EPA for Homeland Security, but we do. Um, sustainable materials and circular economy, safer chemicals and risk assessment. <clears throat> And I know this webinar is targeted towards a nano water audience. I will say we're kind of technology agnostic. We basically put out the problems and you help us solve it. And we don't really care how you solve it. Well, we want you to care about the environment when you solve it, but we don't care what approach you use. Um, so nanotechnology can absolutely be part of the, the technology solution, but we don't ask for any particular types of technologies. We just define the problems. So, um, <clears throat> so these are our topics this year. Again, these have already passed, but I just wanted to show you as an example. Like, so there are the six broad topic areas, and there are the specific um, topics that we ask for proposals. And a lot of these, I do think, could be like um, could have nano solutions. Um, so again, it's sort of up to you. Um, like looking for water reuse technologies, looking for ways to identify microplastics um and detection methods for containments of emerging concern in water so those are just some examples of water topics um, and i'm not going to walk through them all but anyway there they are and again these are done these are this year's they may repeat for next year but this is just to give you an example of sort of the specificity that we use with our topic areas um and actually I have a lot of topics in here and I'm not going to go through all those, but um, just quickly how to apply again you're not going to be applying for another year, but just to repeat that our budget is modest so we're competitive and we ask for proposals only responsive to the specific topics. But I do think I speak for me for sure and probably for other program managers, you can certainly reach out and sort of ask me about your technology, we can chat I can tell you if I think it fits into an EPA portfolio. Um, again, just trying to figure out how to navigate all of these different SBIR agencies. Um, again, for me, I welcome emails the best. I welcome people reaching out to ask about their technology and tell me what they're thinking. Um, we do two types of review that the two arrows there when we're reviewing proposals, we um, again, we look strongly at commercial potential, even in phase one. And then we're also evaluating for technical merit and for relevance to the topic. And those reviews happen simultaneously, and that's really helped us cut our timeline down so we can make awards faster. And here are the review criteria. Again, so it's a third technical, a third relevancy, and a third commercial to one overall score. And I'm gonna kind of just keep it moving because I think I'm running out of time, but Again, a great program, non-dilutive equity in your company, right? No, no loans to pay back. We want you to be successful, but there are a few government requirements before you apply. So if you do want to apply to an agency, please make sure you do your homework. Um, this SAM system is how we do business, contracting business with companies, and it's really slow right now. So if you're thinking of any agency that does contracts, you definitely have to get your SAM registration done, started early. Um, and again, I won't go into all of that, but if you are going to apply, make sure you do your homework on what re registrations are required. And that's it. I think I've said all of these things. Um, start your registrations early. I know I think someone else mentioned a readable proposal. I think it was Genevieve, like think about different people reviewing your proposal and is it understandable and are you conveying like the potential impacts and the high level um, again, the high level impacts that your technology might have. Definitely address all review criteria. We're very process focused. So you'll get a better score if you've reviewed, if you've responded to all of those review criteria. And of course, don't wait to the last minute. Um, okay, success stories really quick. We actually, I could not find any water nano in the last few years. We have some in sorbents, but they're fairly old. The one uh, nanotechnology we had this year is, is an air sensor. So I just thought I would include that. Um, nano affix, it's for, um, sorry, a little something on my screen. It's for sulfur dioxide, which is a chemical of interest to EPA. 
Um, and so that's one example of nanotechnology in the EPA space. And then I, this one also I thought was kind of cool. This one is for HABs, uh, Aqua Real Time, and they do detection of uh, water quality um, and different different water quality um, parameters that would be of interest. And that's it. So that's me, that's my email and some other contact information for the program. Feel free to reach out, um, definitely sign up for our listserv again, if there's any interest and you wanna get future mailings. And I'll hand it back to the organizers. I think you're muted. Sorry about that. I just wanted to say thank you so much, April. Um, I'll ask all of our panelists to go ahead and come on video at this time, and we will take down the shared slides and we will move on to our uh, panel Q&A session. So I will remind all of my attendees that they can use the Q&A to send in your comments and questions at any time. We have some that already came in. I'm gonna lead with those, uh, but we do have about 10, to 15 minutes or so for Q&A. So please feel free to type those into the Q&A space. Um, I'm gonna lead in with some very specific types of questions. Um, a number of people have asked about multiple funding sources and that any impact it may have on their ability to apply. So specifically, one attendee noted, can a company apply to all of the agencies and be awarded SBIR from more than one agency? And someone else had a similar question. If we've gotten other funding, does that count against us? Because it means we have money and we don't need yours or uh, does that work in our favor? Uh, because it shows that our idea or concept was considered um, significant enough that somebody would invest. So I'm just gonna ask the individual panelists if you want to respond first, go ahead and raise your hand in Zoom. But can you talk a bit about uh, whether or not attendees can apply to multiple agencies and get funds from multiple. So Rajesh, I see your hand is up first, go ahead. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think uh, at least NSF uh, encourages people to apply to multiple agencies, uh, that's okay. But you cannot receive uh, multiple awards for the same work. Uh, that would be duplication of uh, efforts and that can actually get, into, uh, get you into a lot of trouble. So you're welcome uh, to apply to multiple agencies, uh, but you can only receive funding only from one source. Uh, so that's the first question. Uh, the, the second one is if you have received money, would it count against you? Uh, at least for NSF, we are really looking at <clears throat> what is the new innovation that we are proposing? How technically risky it is? Is the risk high enough that you need more money? So you have to justify why you need more money. So it is not you know, positive or negative. As such, receiving some support for your work shows that you have some validation from the market. So it probably will be positive, but you still have to make the case why you need more money. Thank you. Would anyone else like to chime in on the panel? All right. Well, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, I, I, I agree with everything Rajesh said. And then just one thing I wanted to add, you know, in, in terms of the question about applying to multiple agencies, it made me think of something that I didn't include in this in my slides, but that NIEHS will accept a phase two if you've done a phase one at one of the other agencies. And I maybe the other panelists can comment on if you have that same reciprocity or not. Just go ahead. Yeah, NSF, uh, you have to enter the program through phase one. Yeah. Okay. That's the same at NOAA. And same for EPA. So we'll send our phase twos to you, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> Great. We get the expensive ones. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you. Um, we did have a, just a clarifying question for SBA's definition. So I believe Genevieve, this question was directed at you. Um, if the organization or company is US owned, can one member of a six member LLC be a non US citizen? Yes, I believe that the you can you can find the specific definitions on sbir.gov, but I believe it's greater than 50% US owned. Okay. 
All right, so in that case of six, right, she would, they would need four, three or four? Yeah, okay. I think it would be four as a minimum because it has to be greater than 50%. Greater than 50%. All right, wonderful. Um, our next uh, question was about reviews. Heather, you mentioned a service that might help them review their grant or help them through that application development process. So I'm not sure if this is what they're asking about, but I do want to read it uh, clearly. One of the attendees asked if any of these agencies are affiliated with a review service that scans and checks for issues with their application. They have been approached by a company who claims that they can do this, but they didn't know if it was a legitimate service. So Heather, I might lead with you since you talked about one and any limitations that you may have. And then if other panelists are aware of <coughs> review services, uh, feel free to raise your hand and we'll go to you next. Okay, sure. So the program that I've mentioned that assists, assists applicants to apply is called the Application Assistance Program, AAP. It's actually put on through the National Cancer Institute, but it applies to all of the NIH institutes. And you're paired with an, 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 a mentor and Eva Garland is the name of the contractor who is, who is in charge of this uh, mentoring program. Uh, I am not aware of a, kind of a, a, you know, a proofreader system, so to speak, for SBIRs. Um, so maybe I'll let the others comment on that. And thanks for thanks for that question. I, do you want me to put the AAP program through the chat? Yeah, you can, and I'll make sure they can get to it. Okay, thanks. Rajesh, go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> we don't have any affiliation with any company to support anything like that. Okay. Okay. And April, I saw your head nodding. So well, I just think there are a lot of for-profit companies like SBR is a great program, but it's a lot of money. So it's got this whole ecosystem of for-profit companies. So just, I would just be skeptical that they're not going to try to charge you money. They, they could be perfectly legitimate and helpful, but it may be, they may be doing it for a fee okay. and not affiliated with an agency. Okay. All right, uh, April, since we have you, um, one of the attendees asked, is EPA expecting more funds with the BIL or IRA? So recent uh, funding acts. <laughs> I wish, you never know. Yes, that um, it's, it's the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, right? Which is has all these great like um, clean energy incentives and it would be really nice if they trickle down to us, but I never know. <laughs> we don't really know until we're the last to know, but that would be great. Okay. Yeah. I may just add to it that uh, this is just a uh, uh, allocation. Uh, real numbers come out only when they are appropriated. So this is just a wish list. We'll have to see when it becomes real. Okay. Well, speaking of that wish list, early on, uh, one of the attendees was asking about those areas of focus or where you were looking for technologies and how each agency came up with these lists or these grant areas or topics. Uh, and they wondered if there was a way to provide input to the agencies on what you were going out with calls for applicants. So uh, I'll just take this. Uh, we are constantly doing that because uh, ours is the broadest uh, solicitation. So if you think that there is a problem in the marketplace, which is uh, important enough. We want us, you to write the proposal, educate our reviewers that this is a huge problem and this is how you are going to crack the nut on that particular difficult problem. And if uh, they agree, uh, they will recommend uh, your idea for the funding because we don't, we are basically technology agnostic and as such topic agnostic also. Okay, okay. Would anyone else like to share? their agency's approach for these topics or areas? I can jump in on this one, Jean. I, I think this is one of those areas where it's probably varies widely at, at each of the given agencies, how the topics are developed. I know some agencies work with technical advisors or even have uh, topic managers across the agency who are responsible for specific areas or um, the NOAA program is very centrally managed. And so we, we work with the technical areas, but ultimately we as the SBI, our program and office are, are deciding what the, the topics are looking at emerging areas and areas of priority for the, for the agency. So it, I think it, it varies widely and um, some agencies probably have more formal mechanisms for impacting the process. 
Okay. Okay. Um, I do see a question about clarifying terms. One attendee noted, uh, what's the difference between SBIR funding that is a grant versus contract? Dr. Mehta mentioned that the NSF program is a grant. Dr. Richards mentioned that the EPA program is a contract award. What is the difference? I'm happy to start. Um, I mean, I'll just say, first of all, it really is just a way to get a small, a small business money from the federal government. Like we have chosen to use contracts and some other agencies use grants. So it is a funding mechanism. And I think it just comes down to like kind of the process, like reporting requirements, building requirements. But really it's, to me, it's kind of the same. Like we give you the money, you go forth and do what you said you were gonna do and, and hopefully make your technology successfully commercializable. So that's a high level summary. Okay. All right. Um, I think if I, I'm going to move on to this next one, this is a very specific one. So I'm going to read this one. Do any of your agencies fund a sequential phase two if the initial phase two was funded by another agency, assuming it is in an area that you are already funding? And then there's a part two to this question if any of you say yes. <laughs> So again, it's a sequential phase two. If the phase two initially was funded by another agency, but it's in a topic area that you're interested in. So uh, for NSF, uh, uh, I just I have to repeat what I just said earlier. The only way to benefit from NSF program is to be applying as a phase one applicant. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then Genevieve? Yeah, I'm going to get a little bit out in the weeds on this, so bear with me, but um, the phase uh, SBIR awardee at any of the agencies is available for what's called phase three opportunities at, at participating agencies, which means um, you can receive a sole source contract for that agency that can be for further research and development. So that would be a mechanism where you could get additional funding. That's one of those phase three opportunities that doesn't, uh, is not funded with SBIR dollars. So you wouldn't necessarily be going through the SBIR program for that. But if there is a technical application or technical interest at the agency beyond the SBIR program, that is one potential mechanism for further research and development funding for something that was funded at a different agency. Okay. Yeah. I, I know of an example where uh, SBIR, uh, NSF SBIR phase two company got an award at DOD SBIR program. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. And a question for all panelists. Um, I'm going to start with you on this one, Heather, though. Uh, one of the attendees was asking if you have examples of successful grants that they can look at as sort of a template or boilerplate. So when they're making their grants application, they know what to put in one. Yeah, thankfully, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, NIAID, they have a whole web page that has several uh, several sample applications and summary statements. Um, proprietary information is redacted. And, uh, and Jean, if you don't mind putting that through the chat, it's a really great resource. And because of this question, I've already added it to our slide set so that it's it's represented in our presentation. But it's an excellent resource to see what the overall format of an NIH proposal looks like. Thanks. Okay. Excellent. Uh, anyone else want to offer up if your agency has example grants or successful applicants online? Okay. We don't provide any uh, example like that, uh, but uh, all our awardees uh, uh, information is there on our awards database. Mm -hmm. And we encourage people to reach out to those companies and ask them whether they are willing to share their proposals. Okay, Genevieve? I will, will also add for, for NOAA, we don't have example applications, but our solicitation or our notice of funding opportunity basically can act as a template because it just lays out all the sections and what needs to be uh, in each of those sections with specific questions that you need to make sure you're answering. So if you walk through that template and make sure you're addressing the, um, the review criteria, that's the best way to, to put together a successful application. Okay. 
Um, I'll also point out here, we're getting near our scheduled end time. There were a slew of other questions and I'm gonna break them down into two groups. A number of people have written in about a specific idea or business or uh, application that they want to put in, but they're not sure which agency is the best fit. And they wondered what they should do or how they should figure out which agency they might be best fit or how they might be able to get help in partnering with others to put grants in. So I will ask my presenters, should they reach out to all four of you and initiate a dialogue and pitch their idea or is there a way for them to, to figure out um, where they might be best fit to apply? For Noah, it, certainly feel free to reach out if, if you feel like something I've said today um, might be something that's a fit. Yeah, okay. I would also just say the same thing. Uh, we get a very high volume of inquiries. So I really encourage people to just submit a project pitch from our website. That gives uh, adequate information for us to actually respond to you whether this is uh, suitable or not. And it probably is not going to take too much of your time. So okay. I think that's a good way to do it. Okay. All right. And I think uh, April April mentioned as well, just give her, you know, same process for NIEHS is that uh, you just send an email. And to Rajesh's point about the volume of inquiries we get, uh, sometimes you need to send two emails. <laughs> and I, I never I never fault somebody for following up again. Uh, it's just um, the volume of, of inquiries we, we get. And generally, uh, for us, it's a one pager. We don't have a set form, but something that like an abstract that gives us an idea of what uh, the company intends to do uh, is helpful to start a conversation. Okay. I would just double down on that concise description of your technology that can convey an idea without like getting in the weeds that is really valuable for us and probably for you too. And then oftentimes I might try to go throughout the agency and share that description. So I just think again, a short high level one and someone in my air office will be like, oh, I could respond to that. Like it's just easier to, to digest, so. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so with just a few minutes left, uh, without a doubt, the most popular question that I was seeing in that queue was, wow, there's a lot of good information here. Uh, is this being recorded? Can I get to these presentations or all of these links? Um, so I will just remind everyone that we do have copies of the presentations already posted on the seminar homepage. I'm going to remind you how to get there in just a moment. The session was recorded. I'm going to tell you how you're going to get to that recording here in just a moment as well. And our speakers did uh, put together a sort of an information packet handout that had a summary of each agency's opportunities. So I placed that in the meeting chat as well right now, but we do have that posted on the seminar homepage. So we will walk through the answers specifically in just a moment. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to thank all of our uh, speakers for joining us and sharing their information. And I'm sure they are looking forward to hearing from some of you based off of their presentations today. And they're hopefully going to see applications coming through the queue for your projects. Um, I think at this time, what I'd like to do is transition over to our closing reminders, unless any of the speakers had a final thought that they wanted to share before I do that. No. All right, excellent, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Let me go ahead and call up our final uh, presentation materials here, and we'll walk through a couple of important reminders before I close out our session today. So the first thing I want to do is thank each and every one of you for uh, joining us on our session. We had about 100 live attendees uh, from both the U.S. and outside of the U.S. I encourage you to visit us at the Cleanup Information Network or cluin.org to find more resources in the hazardous waste uh, cleanup arena. We do have podcasts and host webinars and have a monthly newsletter that goes out on the first of each month called Tech Direct. So if you're not a subscriber, I encourage you to sign up uh, so that you'll be informed of our new resources as we post them. 
The other thing that I did want to highlight, and just remind everyone, the URL shown in red is the seminar homepage that we've created for today's event. Uh, if you go to that website, I've posted it in the meeting chat a few times. I'll do it again one more time before we close out. If you scroll up and down, you'll find sections with various pieces of information on our topic, and there is an area to download the presentation or webinar slides, and then we also have uh, related links and references section. So there's websites, and that uh, information packet has also been posted there. Just note there may be some plus and minus sections uh, on the right that you can use to collapse and expand the web page. So just scroll up and down and, and use those buttons to navigate to get to the material. Uh, and then I'll remind everybody that that URL shown in red is going to be available from today forward. So you can come back to it later on. Uh, you can point it to coworkers or colleagues that you think will be a useful resource. So we encourage you to point them to this site. I often get asked if uh, we have CEUs or PDHs for our sessions. While we don't have those types of credit hours, I can provide you with a participation certificate. And in order to receive one, you'll need to fill out the seminar feedback form. Now that feedback form is one of the sections on the homepage that I just showed you. So again, if you visit the seminar homepage, there'll be a section called feedback form. If you click that and fill it out, making sure to check the box at the bottom, certifying you are here for the entire live event. As soon as you submit your feedback, you'll then have access to download and print print out a participation certificate that has all the details for today's session. Um, if you do not download it from the confirmation screen that you see, we will attempt to email a copy, but sometimes those get uh, caught up in junk and spam filters, so I usually encourage people to download it from the screen. I know a number of you hosted viewing parties at your location, so you were joined by others in your organization at your spot. So uh, I just simply ask those that did register, please take that seminar homepage URL that I shared with you and share it with those who sat in, and they can each give us feedback and get their own participation certificates, even if they don't, um, even if they didn't register individually. So we want to get everyone's feedback if we can. Our session today was recorded and should be available for on-demand playback in approximately one week. You'll get an automated email from me as soon as that online archive is available to watch. Um, and then of course, as I said, on the seminar homepage, you'll find all of the presenters contact information, their slides and that feedback form. And if you are watching the recorded version right now of today's session, right about now in the upper right corner, just above my head in the archive version, there will be a link to the seminar feedback form. So you can either copy down the URL or click that button uh, when you're replaying the recorded version to share your thoughts and you can still get a participation certificate uh, based off of replaying the archive session. So with that, I want to thank everyone who joined us, all of you who shared your questions and your thoughts, our speakers for sharing uh, their time and information on their respective agency solicitations, and all of the organizers who helped to put today's session on. With that, we'll go ahead and formally conclude today's live broadcast. Thank you so very much for joining us.